Um, so I see a few familiar faces here this morning, uh, but if we haven't met, as Jackie mentioned, uh, my name's Sarah and I help businesses build their brand with SEO copywriting and content marketing. Now before I start, is anyone tweeting this morning? Oh yes, <laughs> you, you are? Great. So uh, my Twitter handle is smc underscore Sarah Marie. And I don't think there's a hashtag for BEC breakfast, so we can just make it hashtag BEC breakfast. It's actually a bit of a skill to listen and tweet grammatically correct sentences at the same time, but it is a great tool for content marketing. So, you know, the more practice you get, the better you will become. Um, something to keep you next time, next, uh, next event you attend. You can get on, get on Twitter. So, content marketing. <clears throat> what is it? Why do we need it? And how is it going to help us attract not just customers, but the right kind of customers? The kind of customers that love what you do and will remain loyal to your brand. Now, the first thing you need to know is that content marketing has been around for a very, very long time. Historians have actually discovered content marketing dating back to 4200 BC. It was a, uh, a series of cave paintings that loosely translates to six ways a spear can save you from wild boar. Which is, you know, pretty useful information if you live in the wild and need to protect your family from wild boar. And that is what content marketing is all about. Getting potential customers to be attracted to you and your business by providing them with information that, is, that, that they are passionate about. The idea is that if you provide interesting and useful and relevant information to potential customers, they will eventually reward you with their business and loyalty. Uh, now this quote here is from the founder of the Content Marketing Institute, which is a great source of information and tools and tips on content marketing. Uh, if you want to check it out, just Google Content Marketing Institute. Now, when I say content, I don't just mean words. Uh, although these days with email and internet and social media, there is uh, a greater emphasis on written communication. But words can also be images, sound, vision, face-to-face -face contact, or a combination of all of these things. They're all channels you can use to create useful and interesting information for potential customers. Now, I'm adding useful to uh, Joe's quote here because I am certainly not passionate about tax or accounting, but I value the information sent to me on these topics because it helps me in my business. It fulfills a need. If you provide information that fulfills a need or a want by your target audience, then um, you will be earning their attention rather than paying for it. So if content marketing has been around since 4200 BC, why is it such a big deal now? Why are we suddenly deciding that traditional marketing methods aren't working? Mostly it has to do with the changing style of communication. So back in the day, TV ads and newspapers and brochures would give us information and we would receive it. We may have had a chat with family or friends about it, but essentially it was a one-way communication from the business to the customer. <coughs> These days, with online and in particular with social media, communication has become a two-way process. So we have an opportunity to really engage with our audience and have a conversation with them. <coughs> now, the more we draw our audience in with information that is useful and relevant to them, the more trust and credibility that we will build with our audience. Uh, now Google understands this. Their whole business model revolves around helping people find useful and relevant information. They do this in, I think it's 300 different algorithms uh, to, to calculate that, but lately their algorithms have placed more of a focus on websites that have useful, fresh, high quality, interesting information. And they reward those websites with high rankings. It's the basis of SEO. They also measure usefulness and relevance 
uh, through social media. So, um, the, you know, the, again, the bare basics is that the more likes and shares that your website or pages on your website have, the more useful and interesting Google assumes that your content is because people want to share it with their friends and family, so they assume it's, it's, um, it's interesting and useful. You also have an opportunity to curate and share other people's content. So you don't always have to create it yourself. You know this from you know, likes and shares. Sharing other people's content that you know is useful and interesting to your audience not only connects you with other businesses and perhaps builds better relationships with them, but it allows you to be seen as someone who is generously sharing information that you is going to fulfil a need for your customers. Unlike traditional marketing where the, you, know, you make the sale and then reward customers with you know, access to magazines, uh, newsletters and information, what content marketing is about is attracting those customers and providing them with the useful and interesting information before you've made the sale. Apparently, uh, we're subjected to up to 2,000 marketing messages every day. That figure's been around for a while, so I'm sure it's probably higher than that by now. But the point is that when we can't just be pushing generic messages out into the world anymore. It's just going to get lost in the noise. What we need to do is attract and draw our customers away from the noise so we can have those two-way conversations. So how do we do this? Like anything, it all starts with a good plan. Now this can be as simple or as complex as you like, but you need something to draw all your content together under the one umbrella. We want to mix the mediums, but not mix the message. The first step is to create a home base for your content. Now this will probably be uh, your website. So the idea of having a home base is that every piece of content you create is, has, a, has a place uh, on your, your content home. And no matter how far and wide that content is shared, whether it's an email newsletter, social media, a podcast, an ebook, um, you know, even a, an article in your local newspaper, the one job of that content, or that piece of content, is to direct users back home. You want them to read your piece or view or, or interact with your piece of content and then visit your home base or your website. Now the job of your website is to then convert those browsers into buyers and that is a completely new topic for a new day. Uh, but just keep in mind that you know, once you create that home base of content, then you have a call to action. So every piece of content you're sharing is encouraging people to phone home. How you plan your content uh, really depends on your overall purpose or objective. Uh, Coca-Cola has a great series of videos on YouTube called Content 2020. And I highly recommend you check them out, even if it's just to watch the illustrations. They're fantastic. But what those videos describe is that no matter you know, the fact that they've got multi-million dollar budgets and numerous brands under their belt, the role of every piece of content they create comes back to that overall purpose or objective. And theirs is to create ideas so contagious that they cannot be controlled. Now, you will have your own purpose and objective. Mine is to help businesses tell their stories. So you probably won't see me posting a blog post on you know, 10 reasons why I love hot chips, even though that is a topic that I am deeply passionate about. <laughs> your content needs to relate back to your overall purpose or objective. So think about your goals. Think about uh, why you're in business in the first place. Uh, also think about your competitors and what they're doing with content. You know, if you're a lawyer and all your competitors are producing long, boring email newsletters that you don't think are that engaging, perhaps you want to start a YouTube channel and create, you know, two-minute videos on the latest industry news. Uh, you need to look at the gaps in your industry and how you can fill that with useful, relevant, interesting content. You also need to consider uh, who will produce your content. So if you're going to do it yourself, you need to allocate time into your week to do this, just like you would allocate time in your week to do any other part of your business. 
if you feel like you don't have time, perhaps you want to uh, outsource these activities. But again, the point is to make sure that every piece of content you create <coughs> is high quality, interesting and useful to your audience. Once you've got the, uh, the big picture uh, purpose, goals and, and information set in stone, you can then dig a little deeper and create an editorial calendar, which is basically just an Excel spreadsheet uh, that outlines what content you're going to produce, how you're going to produce it, what audience you'll be targeting, the channels you'll use to distribute that content, and when you're going to publish it. So you've got the plan set in place and you don't need to kind of ad hoc uh, create content through all of your channels. Again, we want to bring it under the one umbrella so that we're creating a consistent message to our customers. The more consistent you are, the more trust and credibility you build with your audience. The saying, uh, familiarity breeds contempt, does not apply to marketing. Familiarity actually breeds contempt. It's why we buy McDonald's if we're next to the, you know, the Eiffel Tower in France. We know what to expect and therefore we trust, um, we trust that product and service. So the more trust and credibility you can build through your content, um, you know, the, the better engaged your audience will be. Speaking of audience, knowing your audience is uh, the first rule of business and it applies to content marketing as well. When you think about who you're targeting, you don't just want to know their age and where they live and what they do. You want to dig deeper. You want to understand what they need, what their fears are, what their concerns are. Now this is called psychographic information. So demographic information is, you know, women aged 20 to 35 living in southern Sydney in uh, professional services roles. Psychographic information goes into their values, their attitudes, their beliefs, their purchasing behaviour, their personality. Uh, once you know your audience, you can really narrow down the kind of content that you can create for them. Now, remember you might have a number of different audiences depending on how many products and services you sell. Um, for me, the audience here today is a vastly <coughs> different audience from a lot of clients that I have. So my kind of speaking and training audience may be different than my marketing copywriting audience. Now, Huggies does this uh, really well. They have a very content rich site, if you want to check it out as an example. They've got videos, recipes, articles on you know, kids' activities, uh, they've got community forums, they've got their social media feeds, and every piece of content on this site is specifically targeted to one of their audience sectors. So they don't just create one video and expect it to you know, resonate with all of each of their audiences. They create separate videos for each audience. So you've got people that are looking to start a family, you've got pregnant women, you've got parents with newborns, you've got parents with toddlers, perhaps grandparents and carers. Each of these audience has a different need and, and want and they're looking for different things. So if I'm a mother with a newborn and I see a video on you know, targeting hugging with customers, it's not going to be as attractive, useful or interesting to me as a video titled Mothers with Newborns. That is going to you know, attract my attention because that fulfills the need or a want. It's directly relevant to me. So you, know, you may be creating more content, but you're specifically targeting each individual customer sector. The next step is to figure out what stories you're going to tell them. Now, stories are intrinsically the best way for us to remember things. Humans are naturally born storytellers. Uh, I'm sure you, you, know, you may not remember the headline of the last Vegemite print ad that you saw, but I'm sure you remember every word to the Happy Little Vegemite song. That song didn't tell you to buy Vegemite at all. It told you a story. Now, your stories might uh, be linked to your brand's personality, your heritage, your values. Whatever it is, it needs to be linked back to that overall purpose or objective. I'm not sure if you've heard of a, uh, a company called Airbnb. Has anyone heard of it? They rent out accommodation uh, in people's homes and properties in 192 countries around the world. 
And uh, I heard a story recently about the founder of Airbnb who was staying in an accommodation rental in Germany. And he was talking to the owner of the property and the owner said that he had a guest come to stay with him recently and he couldn't quite place where he knew him from but they both felt as though they knew each other from somewhere. It took them three days to realise that many years ago they had both been guards on opposite sides of the Berlin Wall and had spent two years staring at each other down the barrel of a gun. Now, and here they were sitting drinking tea in Germany. And I mean, that's a great story and a memorable story that links back to Airbnb's overall purpose, which is to connect people through unique travel experiences. Now your story doesn't need to be as dramatic or as, as complex as that. Something as simple as a, a client testimony from a happy customer is a, the kind of story that you should be telling as much as possible. The best way to find stories is to actually listen. Uh, Tourism Australia did this really well with their Nothing Like Australia campaign. They created a home base for their content, which was nothinglikeaustralia.com. They collected and curated other people's content, so more than 60,000 people uploaded vi videos and images and stories about their favourite travel experiences. Tourism Australia didn't even need to do anything. All they needed to do was listen, create the home base, curate the content, and then go and share it with their audience of passionate and interested, and let's face it, potential customers. So. I mean, that's a, that's a great example of, of content marketing, but even if you're a dentist, you can still find great stories to tell. You know, you can find an article on the way the ancient Egyptians treated teeth, or you might create a short YouTube video with a makeup artist on, you know, best, best makeup tips to show off your newly whitened teeth. Whatever it is, it needs to be memorable. You need to help people remember your business and make it easy for them to go and tell their family and friends and colleagues. It's just like telling a joke. You know, I'm not going to tell my family and friends a joke if I don't remember the punchline. So you need to make your business memorable enough so people can then go and tell other people about you. Now we've touched on this a bit already, uh, but here the focus is that the channel is not the content. So when Coles wants to encourage you to shop in their stores, they don't have a Channel 10 strategy and a Channel 7 strategy and a Facebook strategy and a blogging strategy. They have a content marketing strategy. So that umbrella of content underneath which sits online, social, uh, print, TV and radio. Again, under this umbrella, we may be mixing the mediums, but we're not mixing the message. What you need to keep in mind when you're producing content is that you are a publisher of a media empire, just as powerful as the Murdochs and the Packets. So you need to imagine that your Facebook page is a magazine and your website is a, a publication. You need to be telling stories that are interesting and engaging to potential customers, just as you would you know, see an interesting story on the headline of a magazine that makes you want to go and pick up and buy that magazine. Now, interspersed in between these stories are the ads, just like a magazine. So, for example, um, on your Facebook feed, every fifth or sixth post should probably be an ad for your services uh, <coughs> products. Any more than that, and your customers will do just what you would do if Channel 10 started playing all ads and no shows. They'll change the channel, and so will you. Sorry. You'll change the channel, and so will they. Everyone's going to switch channels. So you need to make sure that every, um, every channel that you use, you act as though it is a magazine or publication. So you have the stories, and interspersed in between there are the ads. Now, another important concept is uh, the right channel at the right time. So if you're you know, targeting an older generation, you wouldn't necessarily um, contact them through Facebook. You need to figure out what channels your customers are using. The best way is to ask or, or you know, put a survey out like the BEC did recently. Ask them what channels they prefer to use and develop your content through these channels. Um, I bet Curtis's recipes on the Coles site, again a very content rich site, 
um, about how to barbecue vegetables probably gets more hits on a Saturday than it does on a Monday morning. So if Coles wait to publish that video on a Monday and expect to get results in that week, it's probably not going to happen. What you need to do is not only figure out what channels your customers are using, a great, great a video is great for cooking because you've got your hands full and you can have the iPad in the kitchen, uh, so it's the right channel, but also the right time. Just like reading a, uh, a TV script on radio isn't going to work, the way you promote your content through your channels needs to be tailored to the, content, to the channel. So, for example, my blog post is the same blog post that I share on numerous channels, but the way I share it is different. So on Facebook, for example, I'll pull a quote from the article. I'll ask a few questions and try and get people engaged. On Twitter, it's more of a short, sharp headline that just the one goal is to get people to click the link. You can produce the same content, but you need to tailor how you share it amongst all your channels. And uh, you know, I, I use social media as an example, but it doesn't necessarily have to be social media. It can be a podcast or an ebook or a, a newsletter that you post to, to your audience. Um, but it needs to be tailored to that specific channel. Remember, you're the publisher, so you need to create engaging stories, um, intersperse them with your ads, send them out at the right, on the right channel at the right time. Last but not least uh, is engagement, and this is about creating content that stimulates conversation amongst your potential customers. The trick is to, you know, that these conversations need to be on a topic that your business has a financial interest in, but it does not necessarily have to be about your business. Better yet, if you can get potential customers engaging on this topic without you involved, so engaging with each other, they will then be, become a new channel uh, that will help build your business through word of mouth. Uh, now, a great example of this is the Nike She Runs the Night events. Have any of you participated in one of those? I don't exercise in public, so <laughs> although it's dark, so it might not. Um, but Nike, uh, Nike's overall objective was to connect with female runners and get them talking about Nike. So that was their purpose. They then assessed their audience, dug deeper into the psychographic information and realised that the perception amongst women was that running was a pursuit dominated by men and that women, regardless of location or age or race or religion, often felt a real fear running alone at night. Fair enough, I'd say. So what they did is create these She Runs the Night events. Now, this is all about not only engaging women but connecting them to each other so they're engaging without, you know, without night for even being involved. They created running communities, and it's all about empowering women to own their body, you know, own the streets, and feel comfortable running at night. Again, this is a topic that Nike has a financial interest in, but it is nothing about shoes. You could have worn your assets to one of these events, or, or join a local running club and, and wear whatever you like. It isn't about selling, it's about engaging potential customers on a topic that your business has a financial interest in. When you're creating content that you want to be, uh, you know, stimulate conversation amongst your potential audience, you need to think about the conversations that people are having in their everyday lives. Uh, so you can imagine women sitting around the table, probably eating cake, talking about their fitness or lack thereof. Um, and you know, one woman, woman says, uh, "Oh, well, you know, it's day that savings is over, and it's cold and it's and rainy, and I just, you know, besides, I don't feel comfortable running at night. You know, it's just not safe in this area." And another woman says, "Oh, that's why I join the gym. You know, it's easier and it's safer and it's it's well lit and so on." So Nike has actually created content that fits naturally into these conversations. What you need to imagine is that you've run into a potential customer in the dairy section of the local supermarket and the kind of conversations that you would have with them there because they're the kind of conversations you should be having uh, with your potential audience every day. That's all from me today. 
Um, but if you want a copy of this presentation, um, it's on SlideShare, so you can uh, download it from there. If you can't find it, then you can visit my home base of all things content and uh, find me and, and pop me an email. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions if, uh, if anyone has any, any questions. I do have a hearing difficulty, so you can hear me nice and loud. Yep. Yeah. Um, hey Sarah. Um, I just wanted to ask, like with that example of Nike and them doing that um, that content, so they've got their home base of content and they send it out through their channels, like so through their LinkedIn, their Facebook. But do they ever look at actually going to other people's channels, like going to Facebook of the local cross country running club and posting there to draw people back? Do they ever include that sort of thing into their content marketing plans? I'm not sure Nike would, I don't think they need to, no, um, just, just because just of the power of the brand yeah. that they've built up over time. But that is definitely um, definitely an opportunity to um, share your kind of your content amongst um, channels. As I said, you know, they would then be curating and sharing your content, which builds a better relationship with them. So um, as I said, it's not all about you creating content and sharing it. It's about sharing it as far and wide as possible, curating and sharing other people's content. Um, so if you, you know, if you have a financial interest in getting people along to a, a running event, um, you might be sharing the nights she run and runs the night events because you know they may need sweatpants or something. I don't know, but um, you know that's definitely an option. The, the further and, and wider that you can spread your content, definitely the better. Hmm. Thanks, Sarah. Um, how important is the CRM side of things? Because from my experience, as a side business, I, I've developed a, a cloud-based uh, CRM to manage all this stuff. Mm. And most people want to do this. The problem is their data's no good. Mm. And if the data's no good, you've got nowhere to go. You can't silo it, you can't cut it, you can't measure it. Uh, you get bored and you get frustrated and you don't do it. And then that's where the thing, I think the base, the, the website's important, but the CRM, how important is that for you? Because when you go in there, you've probably got to have some type of repository there that you can work with to get the results to make you look good, essentially. I mean, it's always good to start with something <coughs> great, but everything starts somewhere. So if you don't have a contact, you know, if you don't have content, then you create it. If you don't have a database for people to share your content with, then you start. Um, and people will only, you know, you, you can't ask people to like you, you need to be likeable. You can't sit there and tell people how amazing your business is. You need to show them why they should believe that. So, you know, if you're starting off with zero Twitter followers or no website or no content or no, you know, audience to target, um, you can start. There's no, there's no excuse really, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so, um, you know, if, the, the problem lies uh, then, um, giving a plug for all the web developers in the room, is that you need to create a home base that is high quality um, and everything you produce should be high quality. So if you have a terrible website, bad content, no channels and don't understand who your audience is and then you get surprised when no one's engaging with your, you know, with your business, then that's why. So you need to focus on the quality of the content and your, you know, your channels and define your audience really well um, before you before you start going out there and, and sharing it. But the only way to do it is to just get started. There's no, you know, you can plan all you like, but you've got the basic plan, and then you need to start creating content. So if you're, you know, if you're using a, a CRM system, um, or you know, you don't have any, you don't have a website, or you feel that it could be better, that's where you start. Wherever you are, that's where you start. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the reluctance is to change yeah. from a CRM point of view because it's a cost, and then you've got to get your data back built. But like the, the home base is absolutely right, and everyone loves their website. Mm. But then, as you know, they want more leads, and then you've got to respend it. And they sort of spend a lot of money on the website, and they feel like they don't want to go backwards again. Yeah. And there's always reluctance. I got sold that once, and that's that's what I've experienced a lot of. And you don't necessarily need to, I mean, the only reason people don't put their money, uh, their hand in their pocket and pay for things is um, the fact that they're afraid, and then you have to look at why they're afraid. Is it because they're uneducated and need to learn the reasons why? You can tell someone they need a website all they like, but unless you show them why they need a website, and you know, 
they're not going to they're not going to do it. So um, yeah, there is a there is a challenge of you know getting people to uh, put their hands in their pockets and, and spend time and money. A lot of content marketing is more about time than money. So um, there is that, but the, the reason people don't spend money is because they're afraid for some reason. So you need to figure out why. Or they actually don't have it. <laughs> yes, and you know, wherever you are, that's where you start. So. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, what type of software is that you use to, to do that if you're doing it? I bought a data suite years and years ago. So be out there now. You don't need any, any software. Um, you, uh, content, again, is not just about the systems and the processes and the technology. It's about the information. You could call your local newspaper and say, you know what, it's coming up to end of financial year, people are stressing, I've got this great article that I'm happy to submit to you about, you know, 10 reasons why you need a plan for next financial year. You know why they're going to publish it? A, they're cheap. B, they don't have enough staff. And C, that information is useful and relevant to their audience. So, I mean, something as simple as that is content marketing. It involves no technology whatsoever. You can send it in the post handwritten with a stamp if they still sell them. I mean, you, you don't need that. It's, it's all about um, the information that they're providing. So not necessarily what content, you know, what technology and systems that you use. Sarah, uh, we can give you lots of feedback from our customers that uh, always happen. Um, the challenge we find is how do you authentically um, convey those kind of feedbacks on content that you need yourself? You kind of feel like you know, you're trying to write uh, content on your customer's behalf, but mm. how that's perceived is not always, you know, it's not authentic in that sense because we're actually kind of writing it. Yeah, and I guess that's about understanding their business as well as they do. So, um, and understanding their audience and what their audience needs. I write um, content from, for everyone from um, facilities <coughs> management companies to New South Wales Health um, to Just Cuts. You know, I don't know anything about medicine or hairdressing or construction, um, but it's about understanding what their business is and who their customers are and the kind of information that they're interested in. Um, and I guess the authenticity comes across when you're just being honest about, um, about the topic. So you're creating um, a magazine for Just Cuts on, on hairdressing tips um, and you're, you, know, you know that the content that they give you, or the, the bullet points um, that they give you, um, are, you know, that is a valid source of information for hairdressers and so on. So the way you write that is um, to understand who they're talking to and, and what the topic is. So it's, it's about understanding the customer as well as they do, if it's on behalf of someone else. I probably should have said, um, we've got a catering business. Right. So we're actually kind of writing content for our own business. Yeah. Uh, but the feedback that we get is from our clients. Does that make okay. Sense? So your client, are they testimonials? Yes, testimonials. Yeah, yeah, great. So if they're good, yeah. then that's how... Um, the best testimonials are actually not edited. Um, yeah. They may read terribly. Most of them do. But um, the best testimonials are just plonked up on your website or your LinkedIn or, or whatever channels you need to share it with, just as they've written it. Um, you know, it's something a bit so-so, you just kind of delete that bit. But, um, you know, the, they're, they're stories that you should be telling and the best way to tell those stories is in their voice uh, because they're, it's their story that you're sharing. So um, it's definitely an opportunity to share those with your audience. So um, as soon as you get a testimony or post it on LinkedIn, post it on your Facebook page, oh look another happy customer, you know, um, write a blog post about, you know, the kind of feedback that your customers are getting and, and how you're working towards improving your services based on those, you know, that feedback and things like that. So use it as an opportunity to tell a story. Yeah. Paul. Can I just add that for Richard in reply to Richard's? Um, a written testimonial can be easy to forge. You could write a hundred things about yourself. If you include some um, information about who the person is, so that it can be followed up in a photograph, that makes it a lot more authentic. But if you video that person speaking, that's totally 100% authentic. And you can do it yourself. Yeah. 
You don't need to get me to do that because it doesn't need to be a professional studio job. But a video testimonial of that person saying how great that supper was that you did is top. Excellent. Um, how do you connect with your customers if you're not sure which channels to go about doing that? Do you know what I mean? It's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. I want to I get that customer, but I'm not sure what, or I want to learn more about that customer, but I don't know how to do that or you know, go about finding them or, or connecting with them. Mm. Um, the interwebs is a wonderful place. And I would start by looking at your competitors and see, you know, if you have similar audiences, uh, what they're doing, what channels they're using, how much success they have. If they have, you know, 20,000 Twitter followers but two Facebook fans, um, then maybe Twitter is the place that you could start. Um, definitely, yeah, research other other companies in your industry that may have similar audiences or even companies outside of your industry that may have similar audiences. Um, yeah, the idea is to, you know, and if you don't know for certain, you kind of assume, uh, you know, uh, mothers with newborns um, are not going to be, you know, perhaps sitting in an office all day. So sending a, a delivery of hard copy articles or newsletters to offices around Sydney targeting those women may not be the best use of your resources, but they are online like every four hours. So, you know, that's where you target them. So a bit of it is guesswork, and then as the more you develop uh, your content strategy, the, the better you'll understand. And I didn't get into measurement today, but I will during the one day workshop later in June if you want to attend. And, um, and that's about uh, adjusting your content according to how much success you're having and how to measure that content. Um, so if it's not working, you move on and you change something else. But initially, when you get when you're getting started, a lot of it is guesswork. So just yeah, looking online and seeing what are the kind of things that your audience will be reading, watching, doing, the kind of conversations they'll be having, um, you know, their kind of personality, what you think they they appreciate in terms of knowledge and information. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much.